It is May 1984, and a Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the USA issues an information notice to all nuclear facilities holding an operating license. These are common practice when a nuclear event has happened, but for once the event being described in the notice isn't something that's happened in the United States, but instead in Argentina. An experimental reactor has had a power excursion killing an operator. The event wouldn't be known by the public in the country of origin. It would, as some accusers say, be covered up by the government, which had recently transitioned from a military junta to a new attempt at democracy. But what was the cause of the event? Operator error? Technical malfunction? Well, watch until the end to find out. Today we're back on a nuclear disaster. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Today we're looking at the RA2 criticality event. Forward. So this video has been on my list for a long ass time. And I've always found reasons not to dig into it, i.e. not much information available, or that I have to deal with poorly translated documents. But today is the day. Now, as we've seen from the early days of the nuclear history of the United States or the USSR, back in the day, in order to understand the ins and outs of the whole fission thingy majiggy, you need to experiment. Which is exactly what was the crack in Argentina in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Background. So our story has to have some bit of background to help contextualise Argentina and its nuclear history. Its official history began in 1950 with the formation of its CNEA, or National Atomic Energy Commission. This, along with other intentions of starting up a nuclear industry, meant that Argentina was the first in South America with such ambitions. The country's first nuclear reactor was the RA-1, which was originally an American design built in Argentina. It was constructed in 1957 and went critical in 1958. And rather interestingly, it is still in use today. But when developing a new industry, one reactor is never enough because you need to try out different types of fuel arrangements and to train up operators without having to clog up your main research reactor. And this is where the RA2 comes into our story. The RA2, interestingly, on this IAEA document I'm just reading, is only really a bit of a side note. However, today, it is the main part of our story. So the RA2 was built in 1966, and it was intended as a zero-power unit, built at the Constituent Atomic Centre, with the mission to test different core configurations. In reality, it did have a power rating at a blistering one-tenth of a watt, so basically it really was zero. It was designed to be an easily reconfigured arrangement and it made use of 90% enriched uranium fuel elements with cadmium elements added to some of the fuel elements for control. This level of enrichment is very, very high. All of this was properly controlled by four control rods which were stainless steel clad cadmium control bars. The reactor core was surrounded by 75mm thick graphite for neutron reflection. All of the reactor fuel rods, control rods and graphite reflectors were placed within a tank, which was filled with demineralised water. The water acts as a moderator in the unit, as well as cooling, which is carried out by convection and natural circulation of the water within the reactor core. Moderators in reactors slow the fast neutrons that are emitted from the uranium as its atoms are split. Slowing down of the neutrons makes it more likely to hit another uranium atom, thus creating another fission reaction. Outside the core tank was shielding and a storage pool for spent fuel elements. On the opposite side of the building was the reactor control room. When it first reached criticality in 1966, it was used to test the RA3 fuel configuration. On the 17th of May 1967, it confirmed the arrangement for the RA3, after which the reactor was then reused for other experiments and training. Over the years, the core configuration would be swapped and changed around, and all seemed rather good. Well, until it stopped being rather good. The Disaster It is Friday the 23rd of September 1983, 
and the RA2 is set for configuration change in order to undertake an experiment for the Monday. Doing the reconfig on Friday would allow the scientists to hit the ground running first thing in the morning next week. Osvaldo Rogulic, an operator with 14 years of experience, was the one to change the core configuration. In order to do this, all of the moderating water had to be emptied from the tank. The operator was working alone in the reactor hall, standing over the water tank with other staff in the control room. However, right from the start, the operator would make a fatal mistake. He only partially emptied the moderating water. Doing it fully would have taken several hours, something the operator didn't want to do on a Friday afternoon. During the reconfiguration, the operator left two fuel elements touching the graphite reflector. And whilst the rearranging was happening, the assembly was quickly approaching criticality. Two fuel elements which were meant to have neutron absorbing cadmium plates installed had not been fitted and the first of which was inserted into the reactor core. We are now moments away from a disaster. The operator then tries to insert the second element. Suddenly a glow is emitted from the reactor tank. Roughly 10 megajoules of energy was released and it lasted around 50 to 70 milliseconds until all of the remaining water in the tank had boiled off. The operator received 2,000 rads of gamma radiation and 1,700 rads of neutrons. This would be well over a fatal dose. There were two people in the control room at the time and they received serious but not life-threatening doses with 15 rads of neutrons and 20 rads of gamma radiation received. Five more people who were working in an adjacent room received half of that of the control room workers. And on top of that, another 10 people received radiation doses of one rad or lower of neutrons and under half a rad of gamma radiation. Shortly after his irradiation, Osvaldo Regulich started to experience the horrific symptoms of acute radiation sickness. This was nausea, vomiting, dizziness, headaches and diarrhoea. By the end of the day, he was experiencing severe gastrointestinal discomfort. The next day, the 25th of September, he became confused as mental and neurological issues started to arise. Next came breathing difficulties and then an edema on his right hand and arm. His death occurred at quarter to 5pm on the 25th of September. The Aftermath Argentina at the time was in the last days of a military junta, which ended in December 1983 after which the country was recovering from a bloody period of its history and a nuclear accident was best unpublicised to the public. As such, the event went largely unknown. Because of this, and with Chernobyl happening shortly after, the RA2 criticality just went forgotten. Accusations have been thrown out that CNEA knowingly covered it up. Whether true or not, neither government would have wanted a bugger up to be made public. CNEA dismantled the reactor core and closed off the building for decontamination, which would take the best part of two decades to complete, with it finally being done in the early 2000s. The spent uranium was sent off to the USA as late as 2007. But what was the cause? Well, it's like most criticality incidents, was down to operator error. The keeping of some moderating water in the tank and the absence of the required cadmium control elements meant it was only going to go one way. Operationally, the operator failed to have a security officer with them nor any auxiliary personnel. It is likely that a case of overconfidence had hit the operators of the RA2 as no real issues had occurred before. This phenomenon was once described to me as imagining a square and its corners over time. These corners get rounded off until you have a circle. Does that kind of make any sense? Anyway, the NRC mentioned in their report that the reactor was getting on in its age, as well as it largely being treated as a bit of a side project to the deemed more important other test reactors in the country. The side effect of this was that no real upgrading of the control room was ever done, thus its equipment was stuck in the 1960s. Argentina today still has nuclear power, which is a good thing, but still tragic for all those who were involved in the RA2 that afternoon in 1983. Right, so it's scale time. I think it's going to be free, and this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? So that's my RA2 video. I hope I did the subject some justice. It does feel really good working on another nuclear reactor video again, but sadly there aren't many more disasters to cover. 
However, there is an accident that happened in Germany, I think around 1984. So would you like me to cover that in a future video? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are created commons attribution share like licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently very warm corner of Southern London, UK. I have Instagram and a second YouTube channel. And I'd like to say a very warm thank you to my YouTube and Patreon members for your financial support, as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching.